Our last speaker is uh, Professor Patricia Berger of uh, UC Berkeley. Um, we're very happy to have her um, giving the concluding remarks. As, uh, as I was saying before, she was really in on the ground floor, or she says maybe the basement, of the exploration of this material, especially from an art historical perspective. Um, you know, um, I'm thinking of uh, essays like her chapter in Latter Days of the Law on the use of tantric Buddhist art in China, and of course her uh, seminal uh, work, uh, Empire of Emptiness, um, focusing on the Qing period, and of course her very prestigious stable of students, including some of our speakers today. Um, you must be very proud. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Patricia Berger to give our final remarks. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, it's such an honor to be here and to listen to these amazing papers and uh, that have been put together, I think, in such a smart way to accompany an exhibition that is a milestone, I have to say. Uh, when I first studied... Yes. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that the end is nigh, so um, that means that I'm going to offer my own round of thanks to Carl Debrezny, among others, for the production of this extraordinary exhibition, uh, which is so thoughtful in the way it's structured that it's yielded all sorts of seeds, I think, that uh, come to fruition in the papers that we heard today. So beginning with Tsering Shaki is really clear-headed and I think extraordinary introduction, which you just did seemingly off the cuff. It was just ex extremely uh, strong, I think, in setting the tone for what followed today, which is a series of papers that I feel I'm completely inadequate to summarize in the time that we have here. Uh, but I would like to say that what emerges from the papers in general are a couple of ideas that I'd like to explore uh, with a story that I'm going to end with. And this has to do with the fact that so many of the papers, in fact, I dare say all of them, have to do with aspects of transmission, of ways of thinking about things, ways of doing things, um, technologies of liberation, ways to obtain advantageous rebirths, magical warfare, as we've seen, used for um, positive ends, we would hope, on the part of those who use them, divination and prophecy, and finally, uh, even gift giving. All of these, it seems to me, in so many disparate places that w came up to in today's discussion, uh, from Xixia and Tsongkha, Yuan and Ming, and even the Qing dynasty, really seem to point to the importance of the creation of lineage. And so it seems to me very apt then that um, this conference is dedicated to the legacy of Elliot Sperling, who I think we all feel ourselves to be part of his legacy. He was one of the very first scholars who had the linguistic uh, abilities to uh, move into the territory that he explored with such expertise and insights. So I consider myself to be one of his as well, despite the fact that I um, never studied with him. We all read his work, and he is, I think, the person who should be honored here today and is being honored. Now, what I wanted to do um, just briefly is to think about this idea of, uh, of uh, lineage. And uh, again, this is a thread that seems to emerge over and over again, how things are transmitted, and the idea of legacy. And to think how um, we can look at all of the ways that lineages were instantiated in Tibet and in the Qing court especially, and to see them as harking to the past as a way of legitimating the present and also propelling a kind of dynamic into the future. So essentially they have a, a, a teleological thrust, and that's something I wanted to think about today because empires can't exist only in the present but they require a kind of systematic and even institutionalized planning for future events that are characterized, for example, in the Qing, where the control even of such things as waterways included sophisticated engineering and planning and the propitiation of appropriate deities. Even Rolpe Dorje uh, participated in some of the work on the Yellow River, for example. So no stone was left unturned in the great empires that um, took this body of knowledge and turned it into a political weapon, in a sense. 
Now, in, from the perspective of Buddhism, particularly the forms that are practiced in Tibet, uh, there are also potent views of the future. So I think it was this that had great attraction for Chen Long, who has been the focus of my research for a very long time. And it is this that uh, Johann Elverskog, who isn't here today, but who wrote a, uh, the final essay in the catalog for the exhibition, um, talks about as a, involving a pair of seemingly very distinct scenarios in the larger Tibetan cultural sphere uh, of a kind of end of days. So this idea of the end is nigh is really what I'm uh, pointing to here, uh, where we have one story that concerns the future Buddha Maitreya. And um, let's see if I can find how to do this again. Yes whom you see here on the left, uh, established in the Yonghegong in Beijing. And on the other hand, a very different uh, type of scenario. Uh, we have Tashi Lumpo here, rather, on the left, and a rather modern sculpture dating to uh, 1914, and the much earlier work, a single piece of sandalwood, colossal in size, in the Yonghegong in Beijing. And we also have a scenario where Maitreya uh, has to share the stage with a very different plot, and that is one that has to do with a, a battle for Sh a Shambhala, this utopic space that is located God knows where, it's hard to say, somewhere behind this, be, beyond the snowy mountains, but hard to locate, which gave it a cr incredible flexibility, I think, in the political uh, uses to which this story was put. So Johan makes the point in his essay that these two ideas uh, exist side by side, essentially, in this period. And it's something that I noticed when I toured the exhibition myself, that Carl had, once again, in his remarkable way, buried at the end of the show, not buried, but actually placed at the end of the show, in order, to, I think, to create this projection into the future. So we have these two possibilities. Uh, one, Maitreya, who will usher in a new kalpa, and another in which heretical forces are defeated in a story told in the Kala Chakra, and which culminates in the creation of a new world centered in Shambhala under the leadership of a vast uh, lineage of kings. So this idea of lineage again uh, pops up here, and we can see that uh, Carl was very lucky, I think, to get these two examples of uh, the two models that we have before us. Uh, the work by Zanabazar of Maitreya in the Harvard Museums, which is absolutely exquisite, and the final battle for Shambhala, a uh, 19th century painting now in the Musée Guimet in Paris. These are extraordinary works that um, uh, give us, uh, I think, a sense of this whole uh, uh, historical possibility that was confronted by the Chenlung Emperor. So while lineage is key to everything from guru veneration to the transmission of technologies of enlightenment and all the ancillary technologies that grew up in the greater Tibet Tibetan sphere that include med medicine, metallurgy, art, astronomy, astrology, divination, prophecy, among many others, uh, it is also important here in the way that this, the political entity that became the Qing Empire, particularly at, at its height under the Chenlong Emperor in the 18th century, um, really uh, modeled itself upon. So this notion comes up, as I said, one way or the other in all the papers we uh, saw today. And what I wanted to focus on was um, just this issue uh, as it was handled by the Chenlong Emperor. Because one of the interesting things to me, I think, as we were thinking about some of the violence uh, that's connected with Tibetan practice, and you know, which is rejected uh, by uh, those who don't know too much about Tibetan Buddhism in favor of a kind of Gandhian pacifism, I think we had that word, term earlier. Um, all of these things, I think, were things that were well known to Chen Lung, and he uh, faced these two systems, I think, with a certain degree of ambivalence. And so I'd like to talk about that just a bit. But first, let's uh, just take a look at another uh, painting of Shambhala. This is a tanka. Uh, it's a little uh, bled out in terms of color here on the screen. This one's in the Rubin Museum. It also dates to the 19th century, and it has the characteristic uh, format of these types of paintings where we have uh, the kingdom of Shambhala with one of, the, uh, one of the kings in the center, surrounded by the various uh, rings of countries around, uh, while in the bottom we have this battle which uh, shows the final king of Shambhala battling the um, uh, heretics, and in this case, uh, returning to William's paper. These are probably intended to be Muslims, and this is something that um, Johann makes a very good uh, argument for in his final chapter in the catalog. So thinking about this, and um, just 
give you another example, uh, just show you a detail of the uh, bottom. You can see this is typically staged this way. And I find this one extremely interesting because it talks, I think, in a really interesting way about the flexibility of this story. Here you see the major generals in the center on their steeds and they're charging forward. They're all wearing heavy armor. The uh, heretics are uh, over here on the side. And there are these marvelous um, uh, moments where here you can see, for example, a cannon, which is, seems to be cast out of iron or uh, some sort of a iron uh, alloy, is shooting off uh, what um, Brian Cuevas has uh, given us this term, uh, cake bombs. So here they go, uh, headed in the direction of the uh, figures over on the side. There are also swords, so he's totally loaded this um, in a way that is uh, impossible to avoid, I think. Um, the idea is that this is the culminating moment. At the end of this moment, everything's going to change and there will be a, a, a whole new world that presents itself. Now, in this case, we already see in this a painting dating to the 19th century, the introduction of new technologies. Um, Dan Martin, years ago, wrote a wonderful article about how Jesuits, who knew how to cast um, metal to make cannons, actually collaborated with Rolpe Dorje in some of the magical warfare. He um, he uh, instituted against uh, the uh, people living in the Jinchuan region in western China and was victorious. So the canon is an important aspect of uh, the story that I wanted to um, unfold uh, quickly here. Uh, whoops. But here is another one, and oh, this is really not visible at all. I'm so sorry. It was bad when I put it in the PowerPoint, but it's worse now. Um, this is an interesting painting in the National Museum of, in, uh, in Prague that dates to the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which literally can only be dated by virtue of the fact that on the side here, let me just go back again. Hmm. On the side, on the right side, uh, there is a group of soldiers whom you can't see here, so you're gonna have to take my word for it, but they're wearing modern Russian uniforms. So the Kala Chakra and the story of Shambhala actually was so flexible that it could really be revitalized at any moment and fitted into a, a scenario where some design for the end of days was gonna be necessary. Now we know that Chenlong's interest in the Kala Chakra was early, actually um, in the uh, 1750s, Probably in 1751, we know that he wrote to the seventh Dalai Lama, or he had Rolpe Dorji write to the seventh Dalai Lama to request this, that a specialist in Kala Chakra be sent to Beijing. Uh, this was just shortly after the establishment of the Yung Hugung as a, a monastery, as we heard in Yulan's paper, uh, and with a college that included Kala Chakra studies. So Kala Chakra was ensconced there. Um, so we know that Chenlong's interest was early. Uh, we don't hear much about it, however, following that. But what I think is fascinating is that this interest, which surfaced presumably in 1751, came to, comes at exactly the same moment when Chenlong uh, commissions the creation of the colossal Maitreya at the Yung Hugung. So that was actually constructed between 1751 uh, and 1753. I'd like to turn to another gift, um, and this fits into uh, Rigshaki's uh, paper. And actually, I was getting a little nervous because I thought you were go going to actually steal my, um, my anecdote here um, because you were getting dangerously close with those clocks. <laughs> but this has to do with a visit of the, um, of the sixth Punchin Lama to Beijing in 1780. And as you may know, um, he vigorously resisted earlier invitations to go to Beijing because he was worried that he was going to die of uh, smallpox, which unfortunately is exactly what transpired. So he saw this as a possibility. But early on, he began to prepare for the eventuality that he would not be able to not attend the uh, emperor's 70th birthday. And that was going to be in 1780. So in 1774, he began to send a series of gifts to the court uh, that included this image of Kala Chakra. And this is the, the Wheel of Time, Kala Chakra, who is at the center of the, uh, of the Tantra and who also figures here um, as the center of the set of paintings that the Punchin Lama 
sent in 1774. There are 33 paintings in all. Unfortunately, only 13 of them survive. But what's interesting about them is that they constitute a set that would fill an entire room. This isn't at all unusual. The Punchin Lama also sent other sets of similar um, importance, I think, in uh, determining how time had unfolded in the past, and that included his, a set of his own lineage portraits. So the lineage portraits that um, he sent were duplicated, I th I'd have to say dozens of times at the Qing court prior to his arrival in 1780, um, when he finally decided to come. Uh, and it got so bad, in fact, that the court ran out of appropriate mounting materials for these duplicate tankas. And so, in, as you can see here, this one is mounted with a typical imperial uh, series of bands, so it's very elaborate. And all of the other ones in this set are likewise. Uh, so Chen Long actually ordered then his workmen to duplicate these brocaded silks uh, by painting them. So just to create dozens and dozens of these sets. So wherever the Punch and Lama went, he could encounter a hall that was filled with his lineage. So this was, I think, a very important strategy on his part. Now, in the case of this gift, which arrives in 1774, um, it's followed by a series of paintings. As I said, in total, there are only 13 left that give us portraits of the Dharma kings of, uh, of Shambhala, the, who are seven in number, followed by the Rigden or, or Kalkin, who come next. So it's a massive set, and they're large in scale. They're gorgeous in detail. They really are the very best work that uh, Tashi Lumpo was capable of producing during this period. So I'll just show you a couple of these so you can see how uh, go just gorgeous they are. It's, there's no other reason than that, just to see them um, in their full glory, beautiful colors. The draftsmanship is superb. They're inscribed um, so that many of the figures are identified, as you can see, in gold inscriptions all over. And as a result, um, these became obviously very important possessions of the, of the Qing court. The last two uh, in, the, in the group feature the 24th and 25th Kalkin, as you can see. And what appears to be going on here in the final painting is, let me just go back, is this extraordinary scene of the general, perhaps Hanuman, um, with his monkey-like face, uh, battling the troops of Shambhala. And everybody has uh, got inscriptions identifying them. So what we have then is a set that essentially begins with Kala Chakra placed in the center and ends with this image of uh, the last Kalkin who will presumably bring the uh, moment when Shambhala will be liberated and where, when a new epic is going to begin. I've um, done this uh, chart so that you can see which ones actually exist all of the colored squares are paintings that are now missing. And I wanted to point specifically, I sh unstupidly chose yellow as a color. It's never to be done. I always tell my students, don't ever use yellow. So of course, that's what I did. But I wanted to point to this uh, f uh, square right here, which is unfortunately a painting that is among the missing. It is a, was originally a portrait of Yashis. So here we have Yashis, who is uh, the very first of the Rigden, or Kalkin, in the Kala Chakra lineage, um, juxtaposed with his uh, uh, Pundarika, who was associated with the uh, Dalai Lamas. Uh, Kalkin, this um, Yashis actually, appears also in the um, pre-incarnation lineage of the Panchen Lama. So I wanted just to point out that here we have this incredibly interesting move on the part of the Panchen Lama where he's inserted himself into a lineage. Um, he's been, in, or been inserted into a lineage that is a different lineage from the one that leads to him becoming the Panchen Lama. So this is a fascinating moment where he's a member of two separate lineages, both of which uh, are incredibly important politically. We can see this also um, already appearing in uh, the series of models done at Nartang and woodblock print form in the early 18th century, uh, where Yashis is again uh, seated here on the left in the woodblock print. He is the second of the pre-incarnations of the Punchin Lamas, and again appearing in a 20th century uh, silk brocade that was done in Hangzhou at the Dujinsheng Silk Factory 
uh, as a gift to the ninth Panchen Lama to remind him of his extraordinary lineage. So all of this weaves together in a very interesting way in Rolpe Dorje's uh, biography, which was written by his disciple uh, Tukwan. And I wanted to turn to that now as a way of concluding this anecdote to say, and here's where I was getting nervous, because we have the gift, which uh, Rig Shakya already told us about, of a, a matchlock and a sword that was given by the Panchen Lama when he arrived in Beijing in 1780. Um, I likewise do not have the actual one. I don't know whether they, they've been identified or not. But these are two from the Royal uh, Armories Museum in Leeds that are from Tibet, and they are both uh, of the period. This one, on the sword on the bottom is slightly earlier. It was this gift that actually created an incredibly interesting moment of ambiguity and ambivalence, I think, in the Chenlun court uh, because of the way it was understood. And it really uh, involves the uh, unfolding, I think, of the motivations of the gift um, on the part of Tukwin. So I wanted just to uh, talk a little bit about that because this is a moment where we now have a kind of a gift that's given that's unexpected. It's not in the usual list of things that a lama would send to the court. Um, but uh, we know that uh, the Panchen Lama must have been aware of Chenlong's incredible uh, reputation as the leader of armies. Um, this is a portrait by Giuseppe Castiglione. Of course, it's again in this suppressed Baroque style that uh, Wen Xing was talking about. And you can also see he's wearing a, a helmet with a, a Dharani on it. And here's the actual helmet in its elaborately constructed box, the way it's stored right now. Um, of course, by the time 1780 rolled around and the Panchen Lama was on his way, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, Chenlong was, had already long celebrated his 10 great conquests that involved the conquest of Xinjiang, of Yunnan, of the Jinshuan region, of Taiwan. It just sort of goes on and on, about which he wrote a lot of poetry. So his reputation as a great conqueror, despite the fact that he never went to war himself, he was very much of an armchair general. I think we all know that. He, um, he uh, was known as the leader of armies. So this is, I think, a, an extraordinary um, gift given the reputation that this emperor had uh, for whatever reason. In the biography, there is this um, long passage that's in the last chapter, actually. I forgot to put the number in, I beg your pardon, in which the gift is um, put into a context by Tukwin. So this anecdote is really interesting um, because it talks about how Tukun was discussing the, this odd gift of a matchlock and a sword to the emperor and wondering what the motivation could possibly be. And he goes on to say um, that it seemed to um, prophesize in a certain way what would happen in the future when uh, certain events, acts of ingratitude, as he calls them, uh, committed sometime later at Tashi Lumpo, uh, involved the, the Manju Gosha Emperor sending troops to combat the Gurkha. This was seen as a kind of a act of treachery on the part of the Panchen Lama's surviving brother by the Chenlong Emperor. And so he's wondering about this. But also, in Tukwan's view, it seemed to point to the moment when the Panchen Lama will be born into the lineage of the precious kings of Shambhala and will join forces with a paired Lama and patron, the Chankya National Preceptor, of course, Rolpe Dorje, and the Manju Gosha Emperor to form a four-pronged force that will conquer all the barbarian troops and cause the Buddhist teachings to appear as daylight once again. So he then goes on to talk about his conversation with Rolpe Dorji. He says, in 1785, when I had an audience with the Chankya National Preceptor, he mentioned this event and he asked me, after the Panchen Lama's gift-giving ritual for the great emperor, the Panchen proceeded to give him all kinds of weapons, and he also gave weapons to me. What do you think was the reason for this? And I replied, in my, this is Tukwan talking now, in my view, this was a portent of the future annihilation of the barbarians. A chuckling, Chankya observed, I think it must have been a sign. One day the Panchen said to me, two generals will turn in the fierce Dharma, wheel of destruction. One is the Dalai Lama, and the other is you. In the future, you will battle the barbarians together. Having said that, a smile appeared on his face, uh, that is, on the Panchen Lama's face, and I pleaded, now we have Chankya talking, half joking, it would be best if the Dalai Lama and Panchen Lama sent me to a world empty of forms, to a world of ultimate bliss, 
to a land like the Tushita heaven of ultimate happiness, which is where, of course, Maitreya is busy waiting um, his ultimate rebirth as a Buddha. If this is impossible, please let me go to a calm, hidden place without any racket or disorder where I can practice quieting my mind. This birth and this world, having responsibility for all sorts of affairs at court, have vexed my mind and confused my thinking. When the battle of Shambhala arises, please let me not be a part of it. When the Punchin heard this, he laughed again. So I think here we have to see this gift as a first foray on the part of the Panchen Lama, which was not capable of being followed up, to see if Chenlong could be enlisted into his vision of a new future that would begin with the destruction uh, of the forces threatening Shambhala. Uh, it's a moment in gift giving that I think is really unprecedented at the Qing court because of the complexity of the motivation. And I have to say, um, I chose this because it talks about endings, and we're ending the, this marvelous conference now. And it once again is time to say that um, how very grateful we all must be to you, Carl, for everything you've done to William, for everything he did to keep us on track, um, to Gray uh, for his organizational skills as well, and to all the panelists who've been so incredibly smart in the way they've uh, constructed their papers to allow the exhibition to take on a whole different life. Um, it would be my dearest hope that this, the proceedings of this conference could be published, because then you'd have the exhibition, the catalog, and the proceedings. Let's hope that some, somebody steps forward to allow this to be possible. Thanks to everyone.